Our next section, 8.5, is still about volume, but the way these solids are created is a little bit different than what we've talked about. Up until this point, our solids have been formed by rotating a region around an axis, either going horizontally or vertically. But this time, our solids are going to be created a little bit differently. For these solids, we're given a bounded region. For this first example, y equals the square root of sine x. And that becomes the base of my solid. So imagine this lying flat on the paper. I'll be given a shape of the cross sections. Uh, squares, rectangles, triangles, and semicircles are popular ones. And what we have for this first one is we've got these squares rising up out of the paper. So they're rising perpendicularly up out of the paper and creating that solid. What's defining that square is the upper minus the lower. So that gives me the side of the square. And I know since it's a square, it's going to rise up that same distance forming this square right here. And I also know to find volume, I integrate that cross-sectional area. So knowing it's a square tells me which formula to use. And you've got several examples right here. So if my cross-sections are semicircles, as in this second example right here, what I would be integrating is the area formula for a semicircle. And what's going to give me the information about that semicircle is looking at that top curve minus the bottom curve. Notice in the semicircles, the uh, top minus bottom is actually giving me the diameter. Um, I know it's hard to imagine what these solids would look like because I'm just giving you a sampling of cross sections, but we'll look at that a little bit later. And you might have cross sections that are triangular in shape. Notice that the first three examples, the one with the squares, the semicircles, and the first one with triangles, those cross sections are going perpendicular to the x axis. And then the second one, my cross sections are going perpendicular to the y axis. So in the first three, that would be an integration with respect to x. And this last one, because I am going perpendicular to the y axis, this would be an integration with respect to y. And the whole big picture, the first three are going to be more important to you. They're asked more frequently than that last one is. So just to recap that, if your cross sections are perpendicular to the x axis, and you will be told in the problem if you're perpendicular to the x or the y, we're going to do an integration with respect to x. That means that our limits reflect an x interval. My function is in terms of x, and I have a dx at the end. If I have cross sections perpendicular to the y axis, then everything is from y's perspective. I have a low y to high y as my limits. My function is in terms of y, and I have a dy at the end. You will be told the shape of that cross section, and that will dictate which of these formulas you use. So if it's a square, there's your square area formula, a rectangle, base times height. Semicircle is 1 half pi r squared. And if you have an isosceles right triangle with the base as a leg, then it's 1 half b squared. Because this is isosceles, that's what allows me to call this b as well. Let's take a look at an example, and you'll understand how these solids are created a little bit better. On example one, b is a region bounded by f of x equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, and g of x, the negative of that. What that is is just the top half of the circle is f of x, and the bottom half of the circle is g of x. And the circle is the base of my solid, and I'm going to have squares perpendicular to the x-axis rising up out of this region. I'm going to attempt to show you what this looks like, and then I'm going to pull in a video that will demonstrate it much better than I will. But going perpendicular to the x-axis, that defines the side of the square, and then rising up perpendicularly out of the paper is that square shape. So notice as I draw a square here, that square is larger than the first one I drew, but it as well is coming up out of the paper. Here along the diameter is the, the largest square, so my figure tops out there, and then it starts to taper off as I move to this region. And I know that this looks just like a bunch of black segments drawn on the circle. So let me pull in a video that's going to show you exactly what's going on here. Here is a picture of my circular base. And what this demonstration is doing is taking that y-axis and lying it flat. You see four squares in that picture. And now here are all the squares 
that are put together to create the solid. So when I put all of those squares together, it creates this solid that is being drawn right now. And our job is going to be finding the volume of this solid. But this gives you a visual of what that figure actually looks like because my picture didn't quite do it. And there it is all formed. There's the original four squares. And then here again is that sweeping square that is going from the far left side over here and sweeping through and creating our solid. And this last view is an aerial view from the top and you can see that uh, circular base. And we know that our volume is gonna be the integral of that cross-sectional area because we're told we have cross-sections that are squares. In place of this area formula, I'm gonna pull out the area of a square formula. So now what I need to figure out is what the side of the square is. And looking at my picture, it is just the upper minus the lower is what is defining the side of all the squares. That would just be f of x minus g of x. And this is what I'm going to pull into my integrand and integrate. The next thing I have to look at are the limits and I can see that my original region, the low x was negative two and my high x was a two and that gives me the limits. Pulling all that together gives me this integral right here. And really all it says is side squared. My limit's negative two to two. And when I put that in the calculator, I get 42.666 or 667. And that gives me the volume of my solid. Let's take a look at another one. At this time, I'm given region R defined by f of x and g of x. Perpendicular to the x-axis tells me this integration is gonna be with respect to x. My cross sections are rectangles. That gives me the area formula that I'm going to use. The area formula for a rectangle involves two variables. We don't know how to do an integration with two variables in it. So look for some information that will allow you to get this down to a single variable. That information is sitting right here. It says that the height is twice the length of the base. And adjusting that original formula, uh, replacing the h with 2b times the b that's there gives me the area formula I'm gonna use is 2b squared. So now I just need to figure out what the base length is. And as I look at my picture over here, if I'm going perpendicular to the x-axis, they are going like this. I've drawn a few of these rectangles for you. The base length is going from f of x to g of x, and it's rising up out of the paper twice that length. So this is b, and the height of it is 2b. What I need to complete this is just that length of b, and it is just f of x minus g of x. So f of x minus g of x is gonna be substituted in for the b. And that equation gives me what I'm going to substitute in for a of x and integrate. The last thing I need here are my limits. I look at my original region, and I can see that it extends from a low x value of zero to a high x value of four, and that gives me my limits. I went ahead and wrote where those limits were coming from. It's a good idea to always back up where you got the zero and four from. That gives me my final integral that I'm just gonna type into my calculator to get my final volume, which is 1.067. And this is volume. These are cubic units, but unless the problem says anything about indicating units, you don't really need to worry about it. All right, let's take a look at one last example here. So again, I have a region bounded by y equals cosine x, y equals x, and x equals zero. So let me find that region first. Be careful when you're finding the region. It could be tempting to pick this one down here by mistake, but it is this highlighted one. So I'm going to go ahead and find my limits first. I need to find that intersection point, and it looks to be a decimal number, so I'm gonna go ahead and store it as well. And just to simplify things a bit, I went ahead and defined cosine x to be y sub one and x to be y sub two. In this question, I'm given that perpendicular to the x-axis, I have semicircles. So my area formula that I'm gonna use is that of a semicircle, which is one half pi r squared. I just need to find out what my radius is here that I'll plug in for my r, put up my integral, I already have my limits, and then I'm good to go. So when I take a look at this, let me draw a few of these semicircular cross sections in here for you. Looking at this graph, 
when I do upper minus lower, that is when I do cosine x minus x, that's actually given me a diameter for these. So when I come over here, I have to do my y1 minus my y2, that is my cosine x minus my x, and divide it by 2, which is taking this from a diameter to a radius because that's what this formula requires. I'm going to go ahead and simplify this a little bit. If I square a fraction, I'm going to square the numerator and the denominator separately. So here my 2 squared became the 4, and then the 4 times the 2 became the 8th. So my area formula that I'm going to integrate is 1 8th pi, and then in parentheses, upper minus lower, y1 minus y2, that quantity being squared. Putting all that together in my integral gives me this 1 8th pi, so I went ahead and pulled it out in front of the integral. My limits of my region go from a low x of 0 to a high x of 0.739, which I have stored as a. And then I just have my upper minus lower, that quantity being squared. And putting that into my calculator gives me an answer of 0.109 or 0.110. In this last problem, we went through the development of that semicircle. But what you're going to find is every time you have a semicircular cross section, you're going to have that 1 8 pi show up. So you can actually shortcut and not have to do this each and every time because that 1 8 pi is going to show up all the time with a semicircular cross section. All of our examples went perpendicular to the x-axis because they are by far the more common type of question. In class, we'll do one perpendicular to the y-axis just so you can see what that looks like.